Hello and welcome to my new YouTube channel. Uh, this is a channel where I'm going to talk about video games and whatnot. <coughs> uh, so, to give you an idea of the ones I'm interested in, I decided I'd do a kind of a game of the year thing uh, for 2015. <coughs> Uh, this is going to go category by category, uh, and the first category is going to be the best platformer of the year. So, without further ado... So, my platformer of the year is uh, Gunman Clive 2. Now, this was made by one person, uh, which is quite impressive. Um, it's a great sequel to an already fantastic game. The original was like two euro on the 3DS, uh, it's, and the next one is 250, this uh, sequel. And you can also get the two of them together on the Wii U in a HD bundle for three quid, which is just an astonishing deal. Uh, regardless, uh, it's very impressive this was made by one guy. The first one kind of had a hand-drawn look, but this one is much more coloured in. Uh, it's much more vibrant. Uh, they've also added in some sort of aerial stages where you ride on a pterodactyl. It's a bit like Star Fox, uh, kind of showing it's harkening back to a couple of 16-bit games as well, uh, while the first one kind of focused on harkening back to 8-bit games. And it's just a very fun game, very well thought out. Uh, there's some cool nods to other games thrown in there, like uh, one particular stage where you see Tetris blocks falling, and you have to avoid them uh, kind of dynamically. Uh, they always fall in the same pattern, so you could just learn it off, but it's kind of fun to try and... Uh, get through it the first time uh, and just a lot of thought went into this game and certainly probably the best value game of the year as well along with best platformer so Gunman Clive 2 good that was Gunman Clive the best platformer I played this year in terms of just pure platformers uh, it's got a bit of extra stuff in it obviously like the Star Fox levels but um, definitely a great game and I would certainly recommend everyone who's watching this video to play it. Uh, so moving on, our next category is Best Shooter. So the obvious pick for me for Shooter of the Year uh, was Splatoon. Uh, my brother and I love it, we've put like 92 hours into it combined. Um, and it's just got a wealth of strategies. It's a new IP from Nintendo which is something we haven't seen in a while. And uh, you, you can just do so many things in this game. There is the more defensive strategy where you could avoid conflict and just ink out the turf and whatnot. Or uh, you could be more aggressive and you could take out uh, your enemies, uh, which my brother prefers to do. Uh, my personal favorite mode is Turf Wars because it's just kind of a bit more casual and you can kind of do a few different things in it. Uh, my brother's favorite is Splat Zones, which is one of the ranked battle modes. Uh, and it's just so fun and actually it had a surprisingly good single player as well um, it's but with a very memorable final boss uh, which is weird because I thought that mode might be a throwaway uh, unfortunately one of the mods that I was most looking forward to was the battle dojo because I, I like local multiplayer and whatnot and that mode really let this game down it's just not fun it's really boring because uh, you're just shooting at balloons and whatnot so Splatoon is a very good game and I would recommend it So that was um, a thing. Uh, so moving on, we now have Best Strategy and RPG. Uh, this is an interesting one for me, because I didn't play Xenoblade Chronicles X. So this is kind of maybe some games you mightn't have heard of. Um, but we'll see what you think. So for Strategy and RPG Game of the Year, uh, for me, it had to be SteamWorld Heist. It's an indie game made by this team called Image from Form in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden. It's a kind of a side-scrolling 2D um, uh, strategy shooter, obviously. Uh, you have free aiming, which is what kind of differentiates this from XCOM or even Fire Emblem, which is kind of similar-ish with its grid-based moving. Uh, 
and basically you will aim it, but there will be a slight sway as you're using a steam powered robot. So there'll be a slight sway almost as if they're breathing, uh, which is adds an element of timing. So it's not just pointing and shooting. Uh, and it's really satisfying when you get a, a successful headshot down. Uh, there's also a l very vibrant world. Uh, the characters are all great. Uh, you can go onto these space bars, which are the kind of the shops, and they're kind of very nice. They've always got nice music playing on in them. And uh, when you dock in with one of them, you actually have to walk from your ship into the place. So that's one thing that kind of makes it just feel a bit more alive and a bit more like a real breathing world. Uh, and other than that, there are just more guns, actually, than Battlefield 4 to choose from, which is means there's quite a lot of variety. And also, there's just a, a wealth of content. You can go for 100% completion by collecting all the hats in the game. Uh, there are hundreds of them, and uh, a lot of them are quite funny, some of their descriptions. Uh, and you'll basically get, the, you can either buy them or shoot them off enemies uh, during battle. So yeah, SteamWorld Heist, strategy and RPG game of the year. So SteamWorld Heist, yep, strategy and RPG game of the year. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the next category, which is racing game of the year. So Fast Racing Neo is my racing game of the year. It is a really cool hark back to F-Zero and it's really uh, kind of imp astounding what the guys at Shinan managed to do with the Wii U hardware. And I mean, it's one of the most impressive games of the generation, graphically speaking. And it's on the Wii U, and it's made by an indie dev for 15 quid, you can get it. Um, the tracks really stood out to me. Uh, there was one, uh, in particular, Diatoshi Station, which was kind of a hark back to uh, the Death Star Trench run. Uh, unfortunately, the game was lacking a bit of personality on its own. Uh, I mean, even the title, Fast Racing Neo, uh, doesn't really stand out to you but it is at least you know honest it, it's fast it's racing and it's new um and it also actually had a cool little twist where you had uh, these different colored boost pads so you could change between orange and blue and depending on which the boost pad would either boost you or be kind of a brake pad uh, so that was a kind of an extra little thing that you had to think about and that was nice so yeah, Fast Racing Neo, Racing Game of the Year. So Fast Racing Neo, um, best racing game of the year, and also um, game with the most honest title, although there is nobody called Neo in it, so um, those Keanu Reeves fans can calm down. The next category is one that's a bit harder to present because it's not quite the kind of thing you want to see a game do. This is a game that uh, I really wanted to be good. I really hoped it would be good and I played it uh, at the demo and I thought it would be good. But unfortunately it wasn't. Uh, so the next category is biggest disappointment of the year. So the disappointment of the year is Typo Man. Uh, I know this is an indie game, so it probably doesn't really can, but this was a game that I played the demo of. It looked great. Uh, the art in it was fantastic. Uh, the atmosphere it set was just superb. The problem is, it didn't quite gel together in the final game. Uh, there were a couple of technical hiccups where there was an odd drop in the frame rate or whatnot, uh, but what really held it back was the archaic puzzle design. Um, Honestly, the puzzles started out good, but in an effort to make them harder, there were a lot of kind of words added into the vocabulary uh, that you had to figure out in certain situations. And sometimes it just wasn't intuitive because you would have been solving a problem a certain way in the previous level, but now it needed a different word. And it was kind of hard to learn it there. Um, and the same thing also happened with one of the game's boss fights, it was really just kind of a learn-it-off kind of thing. There wasn't that much to it. 
um, and it was a bit stupidly difficult compared to the rest of the game. So that's the unfortunate reality. Typo Man, if you're interested, it is a clever enough game, but I just couldn't get into it. So yeah, Typo Man, good atmosphere, great idea, good intent, but unfortunately just didn't quite come together. So to kind of turn that around and go on a bit more positive end of the spectrum, here is the biggest surprise of the year. So the biggest surprise for me of the year was Earthbound Beginnings. Uh, not so much because I thought the game was going to be terrible and it ended up being good. In fact, it's not even that great in and of itself. It's a bit clunky. Uh, but it's just such an oddity because most people would have never even wanted it or wouldn't have expected it at the very least. Um, especially knowing the track record of the Mother series for getting localized. But the localized version has been lurking around Nintendo for many years now, since around 1990 or 1989. And um, it was just so weird to see it finally come out. Uh, and what really won at this award was because it means something. It means that, you know, there might actually be hope we might actually get Mother 3 at long last. Uh, so yeah, Earthbound Beginnings, surprise of the year. So Earthbound Beginnings was the biggest surprise of the year. It was really odd to see Etoy come out and announce this during the Nintendo World Championships. I would have never expected this. But, you know, hopefully it's an omen of things to come. Hopefully we get Mother 3. Anyway, moving on now, we're going to do Best Art Direction for our next game. Best use of the 3DS's unique features for me is SteamWorld Heist. Now, it doesn't use anything with the gyro controls, but it's just uh, the 3D effect. It Really, no game stood out uh, as using the 3D particularly well this year, other than this one. Uh, it just helps make the visuals pop. You can really see uh, some of the background details really stand out, uh, and you see the characters kind of pop a bit more. Plus, there's also little touches, like when you walk into a ship after a heist, you'll see a small uh, bit of rubbish drifting by. So yeah, it's just very good at bringing the world together as such, and it makes it look just that bit more convincing. That was the most unique 3DS game, and now we're going to move on to the most unique uh, Wii U game feature. So best use of a Wii U unique feature for me is Super Mario Maker. It took what's usually a daunting task, uh, creating levels and whatnot, uh, and it made it much easier. Uh, the level editors and things like Little Big Planet and Stealthing are usually much more complicated uh, due to the fact that you have to navigate them with a D-pad and whatnot. Just being able to drag and drop enemies from the row above was so simple and so easy and it meant that you could create a level in five seconds or if you're willing to put the effort in make a great one in f five hours uh, it gave you just enough without giving you too much so you weren't overwhelmed but you sort of were able to make enough different things with it that it wasn't uh, too limiting at the same time uh, and that, that can be seen in all the many different levels uh, unfortunately um, the online interface is not as good as some people would like. There's a lot of auto-scrolling levels and a lot of balls hard levels. A lot of some of the cleverer levels are the ones you might really want to play are kind of pushed to the bottom, uh, which is disappointing, but understandable. Uh, overall, though, uh, the creation tool was one of the most intuitive I've ever seen in a video game, and it was just done perfectly. So that was the best use of the Wii U's unique features, and now we're moving on to Best Art Direction. So the winner for Best Art Direction is Kirby and the Rainbow Paintbrush, uh, not Yoshi's Woolly World, uh, which is gorgeous by the way, but I didn't play the game personally, uh, so I don't feel quite right putting it on here. Kirby was very nice to look at. Um, there was this kind of clay aesthetic that uh, permeated through the entire game and it was just very unique and actually it looked 
very realistic. They added in little fingerprint marks to the texture. Just simple techniques that just made it look, you know, that bit more convincing. Uh, plus, also, some of the enemies were just so freaking cute. Um, and also, there was one particularly uh, nice bit where you see Kirby uh, kind of dancing on a little vinyl record player. Uh, that's in the sound test mode. Um, which is actually another brilliant thing about this game is the sound test mode is rather extensive. It has tracks from all throughout Kirby's history. Uh, but in terms of just the art direction alone, the game is gorgeous and it just makes you want to use a bit of uh, clay. So that was best art direction. And now we now move on to our next category, which is best character. So character of the year was a tough one this year because there were a lot of cool uh, characters, namely the Inklings from Splatoon. But for me, the winners were Seabrass and Piper from SteamWorld Heist. Now these are two specific characters uh, I couldn't pick in between the two, uh, but the reason they won over the Inklings for me was they were specific characters as opposed to just a general group. While you remember the design of the Inklings, uh, the personality uh, of S the Steambots in SteamWorld Heist, you got like, an idea of their personality from their design and also from you know what they said and whatnot. So they actually had uh, more defined characters. And these ones are particularly funny and strong and they're very interesting. Uh, and they also just are part of the reason why SteamWorld Highs is one of my favourite games this year. As you can probably tell, uh, this is its third prize that it's garnered from this little show. So anyway, on to the next category. So those were the best characters, uh, kind of a cop out picking two of them, but I just couldn't choose between them. Uh, they're both really fun and really good characters. Uh, so now I'm going to move on to our next category, which is best multiplayer. We have uh, an offline winner and an online winner, so I'm just going to play the two of them. So online uh, multiplayer of the year is a category that probably most people could see coming from a mile away. Uh, Splatoon got it, obviously. It's just the best part of that game is the online. Uh, while the single player is good, I mean, there isn't much to say about it that hasn't already been said. Uh, it's just a game that you can come back and play again and again for hours and hours. Uh, myself and my brother combined have put about 92 or 93 hours into it, so I think that kind of says it all. So offline multiplayer of the year for me is Runbo. Uh, this is a game that you can play with up to nine people in every single different mode. It was just designed from the ground up to be a multiplayer kind of party game. Uh, it's very good at getting the kind of competitive spirit going. Uh, there's even in the quote unquote campaign uh, where you play through multiple levels, whoever is the first one to reach the end goal uh, gets to choose uh, whether you go, say, left or right or up or down and whatever and whatnot. And that can depend on the kind of levels you'll go through. So some are harder paths and others are easier paths. And it's kind of very interesting to see how your path can meander as people choose different levels. Uh, also, kind of a cool story behind it was that uh, the team at 19am ga 19 games, 13am games uh, that made it... Uh, consists of only nine people so actually they were all able to play test it at once which i thought was kind of a fun interesting thing uh so yeah runbo certainly worth a play and uh, also you get access to a bunch of different uh indie characters in it as well like shovel knight commander video rusty the mutant mods kid that i can never remember the name of uh so yeah runbo offline multiplayer of the year so Splatoon picks up another award and Runbo uh, gets its one because it's kind of an underrated indie game but uh, I certainly think it's worth a try if I've got some friends over. So now we move on to the next uh, category which is Best Soundtrack. So coming to the end we have Best Soundtrack and once again SteamWorld Heist steals the show. Uh, for me it just had such a good atmosphere this game and the music was one of the key factors to that. 
there were also some of the tunes uh, like the title screen tune which was particularly uh, catchy and I found myself getting quite addicted to it uh, also the theme for the uh, home menu theme that you got which was kind of a slightly redone version of the title theme was also uh, very interesting I find sometimes I'd even spend a bit of time before I actually uh, went into the game listening to the theme so yeah steam world heist soundtrack of the year so yeah steam world heist best soundtrack honestly it was just the one i was listening to the most out of any uh, of the soundtracks this year the uh work steam power giraffe did on it was just brilliant uh and it just won out it was quite close though because i split in had some unique tracks which surprisingly uh i got quite you know, stuck in my head. But anyway, uh, moving on to our last category before the big game of the year. Uh, so let's go. So the next category up is community game of the year. But what does that mean? Well, it means the game that the community latched onto the most. Let's players and whatnot. Splendid. Uh, so really, what is there to say about this game other than so many people have shows on their YouTube channels dedicated to it. Uh, it's just really got a great vibe around it. Uh, in spite of the bad sharing tools, still people are having fun sharing levels, and I think it's a testament to the infinite possibilities uh, from this very simple creation tool. Excellent. Super Mario Maker, yep. Probably the game that went down best in the Nintendo community. Uh, so now moving on, it's the big one, uh, the game of the year, but first, the runner-up. So, before I name my big game of the year, I wanted to name my runner-up, which is, drumroll please, Splatoon. Uh, yeah, Splatoon. What else can I say about it? He's a fun game. Uh, so moving on to the actual game of the year, the super duper mega awesome game of the year, drumroll please. Just tell me already, the suspense is killing me. Steam World Heist. Uh, this is probably not a pick that a lot of you were expecting, but I just love this game. Everything from its personality, to its world, to its story, and even, you know, getting on to the actual gameplay, which is the best part. The strategy in this game is not the most in-depth, I'll admit. It's not the most in-depth strategy game you've ever played, but it is one of the most fun and addictive games I've played so far this year. Uh, it's And it's a cheap indie title, which is weird because they're getting more and more high quality, it seems, as the years go on. And finally, one of them has made my personal game of the year, I don't know about you, uh, but certainly I would recommend SteamWorld Heist. Uh, our game of the year uh, for 2015. SteamWorld Heist, probably the game I put the most amount of hours into in the smallest amount of time. It came out right at the end of the year in December, but I just love it. It's my game of the year, uh, so hopefully you can put your game of the year down in the comments, and please like and subscribe, and thank you for watching. And uh, stay tuned over the course of the next month where I'll be doing uh, reviews of these games and then hopefully I'll be getting into other stuff, uh, hopefully some PS3, uh, original Xbox, GameCube, that kind of stuff. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy that and I'll see you.